everybody, David Donaldson here for another weekly episode of Entrepreneurial Impact. And today I'm incredibly excited for our best dressed guest ever. I mean, so much so that I had to go change. Like I'm usually feeling pretty good, but I was not complimenting what our guest was pulling off today. So today I am excited to introduce Rashawn Levin, an amazing productive producing agent for KW United out of the Kingstown Market Center and esteemed author, Rashana. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, David. Oh, I, I'm very happy that we were able to pull this together. And I want to start off uh, for our audience before we kind of dive into the nitty gritty of, of, of your back of the book, right? And, and your inspiration for that. But I want them to understand you, right? What's your background, right? What was your journey like? What inspired you to become a realtor? And who impacted you to help you become who you are? Got it. Okay. So my journey starts many moons ago in 2001. I was actually, well, probably 2000 and then 2001, I was uh, shadowing my cousin because my cousin's a realtor. She's okay. doing other things now, but I was shadowing her and I said, like, oh, I like what she does. So then after I graduated from high school, I got my license. So I've been licensed for a while. I've done other things, but real estate is my home. Yeah. So real estate is your home. So it was your cousin who was licensed and you were able to follow her and say, hey, I like this. Now, was there any one thing that you would like? What attracted you to it? Attracted to real estate? Yeah. Like, was it was it the people? Like, I always joke around and I tell people like, hey, the reason I got my license, right, was because I was nosy, right? Because I, <laughs> so like, obviously there's a social aspect to it, but there's usually something that's a draw for people. What was it for you? Well, I actually wanted to be a, I actually did want to be a writer. I'm a writer now, but that's what I wanted my profession to be. And also I wanted to be a doctor and I would probably just be getting out of school now, my residency. So, and college just wasn't for me uh, at the time. I may go back, but yeah. So I said, well, real estate, I could make the same amount of money that a doctor could. So that's, that's the story. Yeah. You'd just be, you'd have to become a realtor to pay off your doctor's debt. <laughs> yeah. Look, we all have inspirations and drive to get us there. And certainly college is not the end all be all. And it's different today than it was when I went to college. Right. So having those conversations, even with my own son, who's just starting his journey on college right now, like we've had a lot of understandings about, hey, there's a financial aspect of investing in your son and yourself, which is OK. But there's a detriment to it, too, if you lack some sort of clarity about what your direction might be want to be so it's okay to pause and figure yourself out a little bit i mean god you're 17 18 years old when you're starting this nobody's saying hey you have to be a doctor or a lawyer and and unless there are there's no blueprint but you got to do something yeah you well you got to but it's okay to experiment mm -hmm. uh, and because it's too cost prohibitive to not right i actually and i have i've said this on the cast before like I actually had him working on his license now just so he has an understanding and something about, hey, what is it that that does? And there's an opportunity in this field, should I choose to do it? And whether it's for him to become a realtor or for him to invest in his own personal wealth or any other things, it's an understanding foundationally of what business might be in any right. direction. But he can, he can even refer business. I mean, if he has... Yeah. You know, his call if he goes to college, his college friends, you know, all over the country. So that's the little, another source of income for him. Exactly. Right? That's the one thing I love about real estate. It creates avenues of progression and opportunity that not every other field does. Right. And not every and other it's unlimited potential. I mean, you can make whatever you want, you, depends on you. You could follow your dreams and become an author. Yes. So 2001, you got your license. When did you commit full time and saying, this is my career now? I would say, oh, 2006. 2006. Oh, right before the good times. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I've seen it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I got mine in 07. So yes, mm -hmm. we've seen it. Right. So if, if we understand that, hey, we got in when things were good, like things were good in 06. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and then it was short lived before things kind of dropped off a little bit. Right. What were the key moments and experiences in your early career that reaffirmed that, you know, this is my career, this is where, or this is going to allow me to do things that I want to do? What helped shape you early on? What helped shape me? 
Well, in that part, um, I said I'll call it a past life because it was like so long ago now. I feel like it's almost been. 20 come on, now we ain't that. Come on, it wasn't that long ago. Come on, we're. I'm still young. I'm still young. Yes, it was, it was a while ago. Um, I was doing BPOs, and then that I started. Get, I was doing probably ooh, how many BPOs was I done? My biggest month, I think I did maybe eighty BPOs, eighty ninety BPOs, okay. and then that transitioned me into REO. Oh, okay. So and you took advantage time, of I probably had about the market, right? 30, right. I had about 30 um, REOs at the time. Yeah. And for those of you that aren't you know, listening, don't truly understand because it was a different dynamic, a different marketplace. Right. When we talk about BPO, we're talking about broker, broker price opinions, where realtors are hired by banks and institutions to help establish value. It's not official CMA, right? It's not, a, it's not an appraisal, but it's giving the bank an understanding of what that asset's value may be that they are either a having to work within a short sale situation or a potential foreclosure situation. And then they assign it to a realtor to represent them to sell the transaction. So that was your growth path, working with the institutions, establishing relationships, and then building a business through which was the market driven listing side. Right, that it, was right? the market. Then. REOs and short sales that lasted for a couple of years or six or seven or eight or nine and, you know, different areas even bled, bled a little even to 10 or 11 but before we saw some bounce back. Right. But then the challenge with that market was, okay, that was all my focus because, I mean, you really, that's all you could do. So I did, I had to kind of relearn the business with working with buyers and working with a traditional seller. Right. Because, because that market I was the business of the I didn't know how to do time. that really, to be honest. <laughs> Because I was so far removed from it. Well, so the funny thing that. is, if you really kind of look at it this way, you helped. Nobody knew how to do that then. So just think of no, it. Like this. No, no, we were all learning. Nobody knew. Nobody knew how to. There were some specialists that, hey, we do REOs or short because they were few and far between. Right. So that was a micro niche. And then it became the market. So you were one of the people at the forefront of saying, hey, I'm going to embrace where the market is now. Dare we say shift. Right. And that was a creating, and, and, and if I look and the things I've read in the book, it kind of starts to help me understand you a little bit better, right, about your experiences, right? Because right. that helps shape who you are, because now you understand shifting, changing markets to a different degree outside the norm of what a tr traditional balanced marketplace might be, right? Because we right. do have, every 10 years or so, we have to adjust. Yes. So that- and Would you say we're market. in a shift now? Yeah. Exactly. Right. Well, and I talk about 07 and there's not a lot of us that were there then and, and here now. Right. And while there is differences of what we went through then as to the whys, right? At the end of the day, us as business owners are experiencing similar things as that is a downward pressure. And we may be some people are having the best years ever, but some people are having a down year. But right. what we know true is that how we adapt and what we focus on will see us through to the other side because we've done this before. So, all right, awesome. So now let's kind of, we'll, we'll build upon those experiences because that, that's invaluable, right? right? And then, so now we have this book that you've written. It's called The Cost to Close. Yes. Right? And I love that. Yes. I see it. Ta-da. Right? Earmark. I have the hardback. I'm still waiting on them. Oh, hardback. I feel, I feel chipped. All right. I'm going to need another copy. Um, what I love about this, I remember I want to hear from you is like, what? is what drove you to do this? And you say you had passion of writing prior, right? right. But what ultimately drove you to write contract, uh, not contract to close, cost to close? Uh, and what do you hope that readers will take away from reading, it, especially on the real uh, navigating real estate side, which I don't think it's limited to. I'll, I'll bring that up. Right. Well, I had a crazy transaction and I was just kind of, I, I think as an entrepreneur, we all get like, you know what? I, I don't think I want to do this anymore. <laughs> I, I had that more. I was like, you know what? I think I'm done. I, I think I'm done. I had a good run. I think I need to be doing something else. And then I was like, you know what? I always wanted to be a writer. What would this even be a good book to write? And so I went back to all my transactions. Not saying all of them were crazy, but I was like, well, what did I learn from that? Could somebody else learn from that? And then I look at you know, all the new agents that come in the office, they know nothing because real estate school, because I taught principals of real estate, that is not real life. 
No. You don't know real life and you don't know what you need to know until you go through it. You know what you need and to you do to pass. Teach, you, need, you can't teach what's in my book. Yeah, you're just That's passing the exam at that point. Yeah, 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 you don't know anything. <laughs> you know, what do you do when you have that divorce client and you're dealing with different personalities? They don't want to be in the same room. And, you know, what? how do you handle that? So this how is do you your handle room? a house that the utilities are off and your closing is in two hours? <laughs> They, or they haven't moved out yet? Yes, that's in the book too. <laughs> so it's like all those crazy things. And I was like, this happens to everybody. I mean, whether you're doing five transactions or whether you're doing a thousand, it's a story. Everybody has a story. They're like, ooh, I wish I knew that. But you know now because you went with it, you know how to handle it. But I, I, I will be honest, uh, you know, as I was going through this, it wasn't hard to visualize my own experiences. Through Are you like, oh, I remember when that happened to me. Abs absolutely. Like, and that's kind of what turns us into a quick page turner, because you're not just reading and embracing and understanding your point of view for these things. But then it's also taking it back and reflecting and laughing at a lot of times. Your terminology of how you relate, uh, I just absolutely love. You like the analogies? Absolutely. Yeah. From yeah. big top to hospitals, right? really kind of brought things together to me and I got a real great chuckle and I lost my my space sometimes about where I was at because right. of my reflection of what was happening through your conversations in real time. Right, because I did not want the book to be boring because I don't like to read. I should read more, but I don't like to read. So I wanted it to be a page turn. People are like, oh, wait, your page. Every author says their book is great, but it is a good book. <laughs> no, it, it, it absolutely is. But so when you were writing the book, okay, so what personal reflection did you get out of it as you're pulling all these stories right and i'm sure there there are stories I had that left to relive it. it was i had to be vulnerable okay. because i was like well how much do i really because there's a lot of stuff that's not in the book but i was like how much do i want to say am i going to be judged and it it went through so many different versions it took me through three years to write it and i also have to imagine that there was a lot of learning for you because when we go through those experiences like there's a lot of I had to relive it because a lot of these things had happened, you know, 10 years ago. I was like, well, let me, you know, it's of course, everything is not completely real, but you get the whole idea. But yeah, but there's also a second you get a second chance to relook at it because you have compounded experiences since then. Right. right? And then you can relook and reanalyze like, hey, what have I done that differently? How would have I right. handled it differently? Like, did you spend a lot of time as you were writing that and thinking like, hey, this and, and maybe there's some sharing there like, experiences like maybe I could have handled this differently. Right. That's why I, I created the whole in the back of every chapter, think beyond the story, mm -hmm. because it's like, OK, so this doesn't happen to you. I mean, the book isn't some of it. OK, you read the book and you say, oh, well, now I know how to avoid that. But some things are unavoidable. But then if it comes up against you, then you know what the solution is. Absolutely. And, and what Rashawn is talking about here, everybody, as you're listening at home, at the end of every chapter, she's got to think behind the story and closing points is kind of really great of, of not just like, because I think what's awesome about how you broke that down is like you're enjoying the story. Right. And honestly, these a lot of these little could be little vignette, vignettes and stories and experiences right. for people. Ultimately, what you have written down is your value proposition in as an author, right. which is pretty yes, cool. Yes, I need to leverage the book a little bit. Yeah, well, I, I, again, when I look at this, I think of like a social media platform and how you could kind of share these stories and drill home who you are and the value of working for you, right? But then also like the think beyond, right? Because it's like, okay, now let's relook at that and let's look at our closing points and our actions based off of what we learned. And every single chapter has this, right? Why did you decide to tie that learning aspect versus just the storytelling? Because sometimes you like sometimes I always I, I like TV, not a lot of TV, but sometimes you go and then you're like missing your loss. You're like, well, what happens? It's like, well, I see what happened, but what's what's the solution? Nobody tells you the solution. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, well, do this. But how should I implement this later? You know. And I think if you give somebody the tool, then they no longer have the excuse of why they didn't do it. Now, if you're not doing it now and you know what to do, then that's a whole nother story. But if you can't have the excuse like, oh, I don't, I know what I need to do, but then I don't know how to implement that. If I give you the tools and you still don't do it, then maybe this isn't for you. Yeah. I, again, again, this is your perfect real life relation for this things. Like, and in my mind, like I hear you say, hey, like TV, like they, they wrap it up in a nice little bill, but they don't always drive like you're supposed to. It's implied. 
it leaves you wondering. It's like, well, what what do I do? What, but then what if, else? if you remember, I don't know if you if you ever watched the TV show G.I. Joe, the cartoon, at the yeah. end of every one, they would say, now I know. And knowing is half the battle. Like, that's kind of what you're doing here. You're saying right. knowing is half the battle to each of these transactional success stories. Right. Or not even success, just experiences, right? Right. But you don't know. In real estate, you don't know what you need to know. Exactly. And every deal I learned something, like, oh, I, I, you don't know. You'll never know it all. But it's like, oh, I didn't know that. Now I know what I need to do with that. <laughs> Is there any one of these stories that's either in the book or not that resonates the most with you? Hmm. And I kicked myself because I haven't read the book in a while. Ah! I, so in I lived it. <laughs> let me think. Let me think. Let me think. Let me look. Let me look. Uh, like my favorite story, or whether it's your favorite or like the the, the one that was the most impactful to you that you might have learned the most from, and like, wow, that one didn't see that coming. I mean, I like them all. <laughs> well, it's kind of like saying we like all our children, but do we really? Well, sometimes <laughs> I don't have kids, but I may like them. Um, well, I'll, I'll take the Derby. I mean, I, I give that story away for free because I can just remember what it was about. Yeah. Um. So we haven't read that story yet, but that story was big. I learned a lot with that story because uh, the client in the story they were not able to qualify for their program anymore. They were going to get a USDA loan. Yep. And then at the end, it's always at the wee hour. So watchers and listeners of the podcast, usually challenges happen at the end of the transaction. You don't always know in the beginning. So do not count your company. Those darn underwriters. Until it closes. Do not count it. Just have it in a spreadsheet, but don't spend that money yet. But anyway... And so the deal almost fell apart. And so I had to scramble and try to find another solution. And so the client ended up getting an FHA. So the learning lesson with that is I did not know that you can convert that appraisal to FHA and use that. And then we closed in like a week and a half. But I didn't, I had no idea you could do that. The ability to pivot. Right. And that's what I think when we talk about training, and I think where your book is going to be incredible. And it's almost, and I don't know what your intention, we'll talk about that, but there's a workshop in here. Right. The, the, right. There's an opportunity for you to teach things other. Like you said, you, you taught pre licensing, right? This right. this is a different level. This is like a you know college. It's course. kind of like the, the class uh, that KW has bulletproof your transaction, but it goes more in depth. Well, exactly. But the real life experiences take it to another level and the way that you express them, right? They, mm -hmm. they, they're enjoyable. Look, we've been in classes and I'm just like, oh, I'm here because I have to. You get bored. You're like, oh, I'm doodling. Yeah. Look, this could easily, yeah. there, I think there's some CE stuff in here that you could kind of tie into the board and maybe do some things with this. Uh, I think you should look at that. There's a real opportunity for that for you. All right. So when we look well, at they already love the book. It's already on National Association of Realtors. All right, everybody. So you, to get the book, right, we'll put this in the link and some of the marketing materials that you will have for Bashana's website of where you can get that. It's on Amazon. It's on the National Associate Realtors that you could absolutely get. Is it is it downloadable? Have you narrated? Is it an audible? I'm working on the audio book and it was supposed to be in my schedule, but if it's not in your schedule, it doesn't exist. Um, so I'm working on that. My goal was to be done by the end of the year. So are you going to do it yourself? Well, you know, I do. Have, it has to be me. I do have a, a nice baritone voice that I could just. Be yeah. Done. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, it has to be you. Of course it has to be you. Nobody can tell your stories like you. Right. Yeah. Right. This, you know, that we're not talking about fiction here. This is, this is your right. journey, right? It's got an only. I thought about somebody else doing it, but it's, just, yeah, they can't really. No, the, the way that you're going to tell it, right. It's one thing to write it. But the impactfulness of telling the story in the journey of, of hitting your markers, only you know how to be emphatic and when, because right. you're also, again, at that point in time, reliving your journey and how right. you felt in the moment that nobody else, no paid actor is going to be able to replicate. Right. But I think my challenge is why I have not done it, because I don't want the audio book to be boring. I mean, no, the book is not boring, but I don't want it to be like I'm just like reading it. I want it to be like engaging because I have to the people that are listening to it might not get the print printed book. 
So that's I true. want it to be engaging. So that's kind of my challenge of how I want to, do I want to add some extra to it? It or? sounds a little bit of a limiting belief. Yes, yes, yes. But I do agree that you kind of, you got to get your mind right. You got to sure. give a little bit more. It's like, well, why should I get the audio book? I'll get it because I, the people, people don't like to read, but you know, they'll listen to it. Well, I think there's a balance. And I'll be honest. Uh, I am somebody who struggles to read. Not that I don't like to read. I struggle to read and it's, it's an ADHD thing. So what I have started to do. Oh, well, maybe that's what my challenge is. I should stop saying I don't like to read. Yeah. Uh, honestly, in the last five years, I've read more books than I've read in the last 40. Oh, wow. Um, and what happened was I was teaching my kids how to read. I'm like, and I, cause I didn't want them to struggle like me. And, and I went through the process of highlight, like we teach our kids, like read with your finger, but I started teaching them how to highlight a book and read. And I still had trouble focusing. And another agent told me, Hey, add this other layer to it, that if you listen to the book while you're reading the book and highlighting the book, all your senses are digesting and not distracted in other places. And that has been a monumental shift for me uh, about mm -hmm. how I, I read books. So I will literally like, I'll plug in my headphones, I'll open the book, I'll download the audio, and I will highlight and read and write in the margins all at the same time. Okay. People are like, well, that's a lot. I'm like, but it's, it's what works for me. Oh, okay. Maybe something like, to get, you know, like just... That. Just so hey, for those of you at home that struggle reading again, maybe give that a try. It was, it was valuable information that was given to me. All right. So what's next for the book? I, I kind of gave you some subjectives, but now you've written the book. Book two. <laughs> okay. Book two. So this book got published this year. Yes. March. 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 Yeah, so it's year. still new. Still relatively new. What? Okay. So you want to do book two. How are you right. getting the message out about book one? How am I getting the message mm -hmm. out? Uh, I'm getting the message out. I need to be a little bit better about that because I have to find out who my audience is. I think my audience is, I wrote the book for agents now. Everybody should read it, even you know buyers and sellers, but the audience is uh, agents. I would say probably, if I had to guess, a brand new agent to five years. And especially if they've been an agent in the last, like in COVID times, because they have not experienced what's in there. Because I won't say things were easy, but I mean, it really, you close the deal, it's, you don't have the challenges. So you, you don't have those issues with inspections and contingencies because you didn't have them. You softly touched on something that I think you need to be more vocal about from where my mind immediately went through reading these chapters is that yes, absolutely, there's intrinsic value for the beyond licensed agent and saying, Hey, somebody else is going or having gone through things that I haven't. And it's presented me a workflow that I can reference. And you're, you could absolutely mm -hmm. dog eat this thing to go to certain experiences, post transmittal inspection periods, right. contingency fallout, how to deal with the crazy appraiser or underwriter that wants to side like all those things <laughs> are here, but you silently just kind of glossed over that. I think buyers and sellers need to read this too. Mm -hmm. I absolutely went there almost immediately when I started looking at your testimonials on the back and who you were saying your audience was. Your audience absolutely everyone. is everybody. <laughs> everyone. Um, and when I look at that for you from, because uh, you're doing things, the things we do in business, right? Sometimes we do things subconsciously, right? You did something because this was impassioned to you, you wanted to share your stories. Right. But the buy factor that obviously is business building from this, whether it's business building through book sales, builders, business building through real estate, but connecting with a larger audience, right? You right. struck a chord with both agents and the consumer. Right. Well, actually, I don't think I really answered you. I did answer your question, but while I'm thinking as we're talking, why did I write the book? And I've said it before. I wrote the book because... I felt that I didn't just go through it just to go through it. I went through it because I feel that I need to share with someone else so they will learn from my issues. Well, challenge. Challenge. Yours and theirs. Yeah. Right. And absolutely. Like, and and I, you I, say, I, well, you're not alone. Everybody thinks because, I mean, we're business owners, but we're like by ourselves sometimes. So 
it's like, oh, am I the only one? You feel like when it's happening to you, like the world is ending, everything is falling, the sky is falling. But you're not the only one that's howling, that's dealing with this. Yeah. How long did it take you to write the book? Three years. Three. Well, I started, actually, I, I looked at my Facebook feed. I started right before my birthday in December 2019. Then COVID happened. I didn't even open the book at all in 2020. Uh, and then 2021, I was like, oh, yeah, I'm writing it. Then I put it to the side. And then, like, it's, it's been like that. And then I said, like, well, you know what? I'm going to commit the last part of last year, 2023. Well, what are you, Yeah, 24. Okay. So just a little year, bit longer. The last six months, I said, you know what? I'm going to finish this book. I'm going to put the business to the side. Whatever I got going, that's just what it's going to be. And I'm going to finish it because I was like, I'll be saying this for another. Because I kept saying, it's like, oh, I'm working on a book. And people, I think people thought I was joking. I was like, I actually didn't write no book. <laughs> she keeps saying she's writing a book. And I said, you know, I'm going to finish this. I'm going to have it done. And I finished on my birthday. Ah. Uh. Yeah. Was there anything that you learned besides like how to kind of present and pull this together? But what were some of the harder lessons? Because I think a lot of people obviously have got those great experiences. I could write a book. Writing a book is challenging, especially when you're doing it on your own. Because I'm self-published. That was that oh, okay. was hard. <laughs> that was hard. It's a lot more than, you know, because I wanted to do a website. Actually, the website, the for a plug for the website. The website also has... Um, like compliments to the book for the business also. Okay. So I'm, it's probably about 20 things there. So I'm still working on some like different downloads that people need. And then it has like an email series, like it's a hundred days of things to, um, to do. So every day is something new that you do. Like every day you say, okay, well, this is all the links for this. And then this is how it is. So there's a lot of resources we have. As See, well. I didn't even, so there truly is a workshop with this. I didn't even, I, worked, oh, yeah. I, I well, didn't even realize. It's not really technically well, a workshop, but it's activity based resources yeah. for, for the, for the agents to kind of yeah. plug in. Right. Uh, to like I had videos on how to do um, chat GPT and, and all well, that. So what is the website? Cost to close.com. Cost to close.com bookmark it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to, right. Look, <laughs> Chat GDP, right? People think, oh, I could just tell it to write a book. That's not what you did here. Like, and when no, you get no, into no. this, you could tell no. because, like, again, you look at the the conversation was a nice play because it really kind of drove it all home, right? And the synopsis and, and the real. What's life. your favorite story so far? Uh, you know, I, I really kind of get with the design center because I did a lot of new construction um. uh, from the ground up, and that whole aspect. And I love golf, so tying the two together. Um, and understanding the whole gotcha moment when somebody walks in bushy eyed and bright eyed about going into a design center. My first closing was a new construction back in 2007. Oh, wow. It was 2007. It was a $500,000 purchase that actually ended up being. Over oh, that was a lot back. It's still a lot now. But that and was that was in Arizona. Back. Like that was, even here. It was in Arizona. It was on the mountainside. Like it was gorgeous. And, but they spent mm. another 300 on upgrades, pools, elevations, yeah. So you had a flashback. I had a total flashback because I got paid on like 450. Right. I got paid on the base value. That was like, you were talking about like alert life. But I'm saying, was the house over improved though that it didn't appraise? Oh, uh, well, but well, again, remember the year that I just said this was 07 when they did the purchase in Arizona when the bottom fell out. So they bought it, they closed on it for about 800000 I got paid at a base price of 450, which I didn't understand at the time. But I was like, oh, I'm getting 3% on 800000 No, you're not. Right. I got off the base price. <laughs> they ended up foreclosing on that house three years later. I, oh, no. yeah, we ended up selling it in the fours. Yikes. That's how bad the market got in Arizona. But you know what? The value with things are how they are now, they're probably back up to where they. Well, absolutely. It, you know, in Arizona, we went really like it was bad for a long time. And yes, they are a well, but these are people that had to get out by 2010. Mm. I did, this is 14 years later now, right? Uh, yes, that house absolutely devalues. That house is probably north of 800 now, without a doubt. Um, wow. But at that time, they it didn't make sense. Hmm. Plus, about, and I don't recall purposes, but there was probably some sort of, uh, there was a lot of arms back then that they probably had a five-year arm. Right. But you know what? I feel like that's what they're not, the industry is not talking about. We had a lot of people that had adjustable rate mortgages. Like mm -hmm. what happened to them? Were they able to refinance? No, they all foreclosed. Like, I, don't, I don't know. 
There well, not all of them, though. A lot of them did. And, well, where I was, a lot of them did in Arizona because they couldn't refinance because the value wasn't there. And right. it would have made sense for the banks to refi them out, but there was no triggers or mechanisms for the banks to actually do it. It goes back right. into the learning curve of like, hopefully we won't see that again from an experience. I know that my experiences in working through that with my consumers will allow me to educate them differently because at some point in time, because of interest rates being high again, we will see arms available, right? We They didn't right. need them when we raised for 3%, but north of six and seven, they might be attractive to some people. The conversations are different. Right. But you have to understand the product to be able to share. Like, well, are you looking at? You know, you have to. You have to know a lot of different things. Absolutely. Well, it's been amazing. Thirty minutes. Look how quickly that went by. I told you it would fly. That was by. Fast. We're going to have some some fun. <laughs> but let's wrap this up with a couple of other things. What does legacy mean to you? Like, you've put some things down on paper, but when you look ahead and saying, "I was driven to do this," but to do that. There's a vulnerability aspect to it, but I also think there has to be a, a legacy contingent to that. What do you want this lasting impression to be for people when they think back and, and they've read this book and the experiences they have because you've taken them on a journey? To say, wow, she was vulnerable enough to teach us and let us know that it's okay to go through things as long as you learn. But now that I've read and learned her stories, that I can I can deal with this. It's okay. That's all. I, I'm going to read a quote to everybody from your book, and it's kind of a quick synopsis of a couple paragraphs, actually. You know, there's a noticeable gap, a lack of a one size fits all solution that necessitates an avoidance list for agents, a toolkit circumventing common pitfalls. Right? Real estate is a domain of endless nuances, demanding agents to master not just the logistics of deals, but also the delicate art of managing human emotions. I think you've accomplished that in this book. And I want to thank you for putting it down on paper and taking me on that journey with you. And I challenge all of you at home to give this a read. It'll be worth your time and it'll enhance your experience and make you the better agent all there for it. So Rashana, thank you for joining us. And we look forward to hearing more from you and book two. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure.